Hey everyone, so let's go over another one of these practice exams. So first up, we have a couple of transformations and we need to provide the reagents that would be used to achieve the transformation, whether in one or more reactions. So first, this one's pretty simple. We've got uh, this diene. We have two pi bonds there and we want to go to the alkane. So clearly we want to do some hydrogenation and as it happens this one we don't really have to think too much we're just going to do hydrogenation over some transition metal catalyst usually platinum could be palladium uh, there's a couple of ways to do this but just our whatever our conditions are that you're used to in your class for hydrogenation uh, over some transition metal that's what what it's going to be so we're just going to get rid of those pi bonds we're going to add hydrogen atoms to uh, all of those carbons that are participating in the pi bonds. So that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, now looking at this one, we have something a little bit different. We have a uh, we have a, a halo alkane, and we're going to the alkane. So we want to get rid of this halogen uh, atom, right? We want to get rid of that bromine. So uh, what are we going to do? Well, we can't do any substitution. That would just put another functional group there. Uh, so what do we think? Well, if we want to get rid of this atom, one good way to do it would be uh, elimination. So let's do, uh, how do we, what, what do we want to use to eliminate? That, that's one question. In this case, it doesn't really matter that much. Let's just use uh, tert butoxide uh, because we're, uh, you know, we're, it, we could, it doesn't really matter which side. First of all, we're going to get the same substitution uh, no matter which side uh, we do. But we just want to ensure that we get no competing substitution. So as long as we do uh, tert butoxide, we know for sure that we're going to get exclusively the elimination product. So let's go ahead and draw our elimination product. And of course, there are two possible elimination products. Right? We could have gotten that double bond over there, but it actually doesn't really matter because now we can just do what we did before. Let's hydrogenate over platinum metal again and get rid of that pi bond and we'll get the alkane. So that's one way you could have done it, right? Uh, it seems to me to be the most straightforward way to do it. Eliminate hydrogenation, that's pretty straightforward. So those are two quick ones there. Now let's do a few multiple choice. This one asks, which of the following compounds has a trigonal pyramid or a trigonal pyramidal uh, molecular shape? And we have these three options here. So let's go ahead and draw these out. Let's draw the Lewis dot structures with uh, accurate geometries here. So ammonia, Right, we know that NH3 looks like this. Right, we know that it has this uh, configuration because of the lone pair on the nitrogen. Right now, BF3 is a little bit different because boron only has three valence electrons. So it can only uh, make three bonds and it will have no lone pair left over. So this will have a, a bit of a different shape. And then methane, as we know, looks like this. So in terms of electron domain geometry, right, electron domain geometry, ammonia and methane uh, both have a tetrahedral electron domain geometry because they each have four electron domains, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, so these, the nitrogen and the carbon are both sp3 hybridized, whereas BF3, boron is sp2 hybridized, so it takes on this trigonal planar configuration. But it says trigonal pyramidal molecular shape, so that would be where we ignore the lone pairs. And that would be ammonia. This has a trigonal pyramidal molecular shape. So that's going to be NH3. Next one asks, which of the following bonds is ionic? Now, when we want to understand, when we want to predict whether two elements are going to make covalent or ionic bonds, we have to see what types of elements they are. We certainly have to, uh, we could look at their electronegativities, but a quick thing to do is to just uh, ask whether they are metals or nonmetals. Right, uh, because we have to we have to remember that when two nonmetals interact, they're probably going to make covalent bonds. Whereas when a metal and a nonmetal interact, they're probably going to make an ionic bond. So this is two nonmetals. This is two nonmetals, and then over here we've got a metal and a nonmetal. So that's going to be potassium bromide. That's K plus and Br minus. So uh, that's a quick one to spot by virtue of the types of elements there. Now, the highlighted atom of the following compound has, and we're going to pick the uh, hybridization. So whenever we see anything written out in condensed formula notation like this, it's always a good idea to write it out explicitly in line notation because it can be very confusing. We don't see what kind of, what kind of bonds there are, single bond, double bond, triple bond, etc. So, okay, we've got CH3 connected to C. Now C is connected to H and Br and then another C. 
So we have H and then BR, and so the, the H is implied, but we'll do H, so we'll do BR, and then that's connected to the next C. So remember, we have one, two, three, like that, right? One, two, three. Now this C is connected to H and then another C. So if it's connected only to H and then another C, then we're missing a bond. So this must be a double bond, right? And then this C is connected to H and then CH3. Right, so uh, we can count them up and make sure that they're all accounted for. We've got three hydrogens there, one hydrogen there, that's that one, one hydrogen there, that's that one, one hydrogen there, that's that one, and then three, which are those. So we want to know about this one, which is this one. So what is the hybridization there? Well, as we said, we have the bromine. We, let's draw in that implied hydrogen. We've got one, two, three, four, four electron domains. Any atom that uh, that is surrounded by four electron domains is sp3 hybridized. That's why it has that tetrahedral geometry there. So once again, just always when condensed formula notation, just write it out in line notation. That's going to make things a lot more clear. Okay, let's do a quick IUPAC nomenclature. So for these, as we know, uh, the first step is always to identify the parent chain. And the parent chain is always the longest carbon chain. So let's take this. That is going to be this. We got to go up here, and then uh, either of these methyls will be fine, right? Those are identical methyls, so that is arbitrary. We could select this, or we could select this, and it would be the same thing. But that must be the parent chain. And now we must number uh, the chain, and it can be left to right or right to left, and we must number so as to give the first substituent occurring soonest. So we have to go right to left because that gives us a substituent on carbon 2 as opposed to 1, 2, 3, 4 if we go the other way. And that is the case because these are all alkyl substituents. If there were a higher priority group like a double bond or a hydroxyl, we would have to number to give specifically that one occurring soonest. But here they're just alkyl. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So nine carbons, this is a nonane. <clears throat> and what do we have? On carbon two, we have a methyl. On carbon four, we have an ethyl. And on carbon six, we have an isopropyl. Now we need to list these substituents in alphabetical order. So which comes first? We have E and then I and then M. So we're going to say four ethyl six isopropyl 2-methyl nonane, nonane for the nine carbons. And one quick point, uh, we have to remember that uh, I for iso, we do count the I in the uh, alphabeticity. So it is I before M rather than P. Uh, this is different from things like um, sec butyl, tert butyl, the ones that have the hyphens in between, let's say, tert and butyl, those prefixes do not count towards alphabeticity. Uh, neither do dimethyl, trimethyl, etc. This is the only one that for some reason, I'm not sure why the IUPAC decided to do this, but isopropyl is I for iso. So iso is the one uh, prefix that we do have to remember does count towards alphabeticity, which means isopropyl is listed before methyl. If you switch them, that would actually be incorrect. So that is the correct name there. And then draw the lowest energy conformation of the following tri-substituted tri cyclohexane. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about quantifying the strain. Let's just, let's just worry about getting these cyclohexane chair conformations. So let's draw one chair here. And then let's draw the other chair over here. So you got to get good at drawing these chairs. Uh, we don't want any vertical lines. We don't want any bow tie syndrome. They got to look uh, pretty much like this. So now we or remember that we can arbitrarily decide which which uh, we can pick one, the first substituent, and put it anywhere we want. Uh, and so I'm going to say that this carbon is the leftmost carbon because that's just the way I like to do it. So if that's this, then we have an isopropyl group going up. And the up direction on this is the axial uh, is the axial position. So we've got to have the isopropyl up. So that one was arbitrary, but now that I've decided one of them, the rest are not arbitrary. So on the opposite side of the ring, we've got a methyl group going down. So that would be here, methyl group going down. 
and then one more clockwise, we have another methyl group going down. So once I decided to put this isopropyl group here, these two had to be exactly where they are. Uh, so that is one configuration uh, or, or confirmation. Now let's flip that chair and draw the other one. This isopropyl is on the leftmost carbon going up, so it better still be on the leftmost carbon going up. The only difference is now up for this carbon is the equatorial position. Remember that when you when you flip the chair, everything that's axial becomes equatorial and everything that's equatorial becomes axial. Uh, and then we have a methyl going down, uh, which is now equatorial. And then this equatorial methyl is still going down. And so that is now axial. So uh, remember, if you're confused, you can always number your own carbons. I like to start here and then just maybe go clockwise like that. Remember, those are not IUPAC numbers. That's just bookkeeping to help you. And then here you would still go clockwise. So I do see a lot of errors where students maybe would not have put this methyl on the correct carbon, but maybe on some other carbon. That usually stems from not visualizing the chair correctly. This is, we are looking at a six-membered ring edge on. So it, it is like a lawn chair, essentially. So we do want to be able to see it that way. Uh, and so now we want to talk about stability where, oh, well, over here we have an isopropyl seal and then we have methyl that is equatorial and methyl that is axial. Over here we have isopropyl equatorial and then we have a methyl that is equatorial and a methyl that is, uh, that is axial. And so uh, what we're seeing is that in each case, we can cancel these out, methyl equatorial, methyl axial, right? Each one of them has those two things, so that that aspect is equivalent, and so uh, certainly what wins is the one that has the isopropyl that is equatorial versus axial. So this is clearly the more stable uh, confirmation or the lowest energy confirma confirmation of the two chair confirmations for this uh, tri-substituted cyclohexane. And then if we wanted, uh, in this particular exam on the last page, I didn't include it, there's a table of, uh, of a quantitative uh, uh, diaxial interactions. You just add them up, right? You just say, we've got one methyl group in the uh, axial position. So you go get that number, that would be the answer. Uh, so that's it for, uh, for this exam. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.